Excellent. Welcome back, everyone. Um, our next session is Ghost Kitchens 101. Our speakers are Chef Carrie Goodman, founder and part owner of the City Kitch in North Carolina, and Ilana Greenblatt, director of Nassau County Departmental Health's Office of Food Protection, Bureau of Environmental Sanitation in New York. Ghost kitchens seem to be popping up everywhere, and we're very happy to have Chef Carrie and Ilana to speak on this topic from an industry and regulatory perspective. Chef Carrie, go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your video when you're ready. Thank you guys. Good morning. How are you? I know you've had a long day already. Uh, lots of good information. You could probably see I'm in an RV. Uh, I've retired, so I'm really excited to be joining you guys from parts unknown in a forest somewhere. So um, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you guys today about ghost kitchens. And we're just calling it 101 because I'm going to hit some basics. And I know you guys know quite a bit about uh, the terms that have been coming and going around uh, uh, various businesses that are somewhat like restaurants. And we're getting into some pretty fuzzy areas. So um, I wanted to uh, share my background with you and uh, what we've found and what's going on around here in North Carolina. Uh, I know that uh, specifically in New York and New Jersey, you guys are having a lot of trouble with the pop-ups. And uh, we're gonna just talk about what those are. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, just talking about ghosts in the machine. When you hear ghost kitchen, it's like, well, what do you mean by that? What, what is the definition of that? So this is a relatively new term, and I just want to hit the definition of that real quick. You can see in the picture that we're looking at a shared use kitchen, very large, what you would call a commercial kitchen with shared equipment. Uh, several businesses work together, um, and there is a completely separate operator, the person who runs the facility and the services and the utilities. Uh, and they are also in the state of North Carolina inspected and permitted as well. Um, but not based on the client's food, based on the facility itself and whether or not we are following uh, HACCP guidelines and proper safety and sanitation. So uh, talking about a ghost is like, well, what does that mean? That means something is not really what it seems to be. So let's move on to the next slide and we can talk more about that. Okay. It all starts with a shared use commercial kitchen. Now, uh, commercial kitchen, first of all, you guys know that just means somebody in the in business, you know, you're not at home, you're not in the cottage industry, um, you're actually in a commercial kitchen, that means you must follow guidelines set up by the health department, uh, FDA, USDA, depending on the food that you're producing. And that is the catch-all term, really. Um, and, and that is the one that is the base term that everything else is based off of, a uh, commercial kitchen. That just simply means you're in business um, and you are held to a higher standard. When you get into um, the term uh, ghost kitchen, it means that it's not a restaurant. And, and it's specifically that ghost, the word ghost kitchen comes up because of the word restaurant. When the general public thinks about the word restaurant, uh, they're thinking about a place to go and sit and dine and enjoy themselves. And um, as you know, with COVID, our market has changed so drastically that, um, well, even before COVID, I mean, they started popping up, but now, oh my gosh, you know, we're really going uh, light speed now. But a uh, ghost kitchen simply means you do not have a place for people to sit. Uh, you do not have a prominent address. You do not have prominent branding on your building. Um, which means you could be anywhere, um, which can be scary for regulators for sure. Um, but uh, it just means that you, you have the restaurant name or the brand name, whatever it is you're using, and um, you are somewhere in a delivery area uh, for, your, for your clients, for your constituents, whoever it is you're working for. Maybe you're in the middle of a city like Charlotte, North Carolina or um, uh, New York City. So you're in the middle uh, of your delivery zone and you do not have a presence like somebody could walk by on the street and they would not even know you're in there. Uh, and that is ghost kitchen. That's what we mean by ghost kitchen. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of these terms have been appropriated and just taken to mean whatever. So you kind of got to drill down with whoever it is you're talking to. If they say, oh, ghost kitchen, that's just kind of a cool term. 
and uh, you you can ferret down, ferret, see if you can find out what they're talking about actually, because there's a lot of different things going on out there. Uh, first of all, and it's not talking about, it doesn't say it up here on the PowerPoint, but is a commissary. What is a commissary? Uh, this was a real issue for us when we started in 2013. Uh, are we a commissary? What is the definition of a commissary? And I know you guys know that means that they are producing food in one central location that is sent out into other satellite locations. And, you know, for them, of course, it's the, the friction of delivery uh, is going to be their big issue. And you guys are, uh, you know, checking them out and making sure all that is, is uh, taken into consideration and is safe and sanitary and temperature minded. Um, so that's a commissary operation. Those are usually big enough to where they've gone through all the, the various agencies they need to go through. And, and those are not the issue. Those are not the problem. Those are the good guys. Those are the ones that are trying to uh, just make their larger businesses work and have some standardized recipes that are produced in bulk and then sent out to the satellites. So that is a commissary. And they are also a type of commercial kitchen. A ghost kitchen is a type of commercial kitchen. It really has to do with the framework. What is the framework of how the business operates? Are they set up uh, uh, directly for delivery only? Or is there a walk-up presence? Is there a dine-in presence? Then we're kind of used to that. That's a restaurant. Okay, we get that. Um, especially if you're looking into the code, you're looking at the, the word restaurant as if it only means one thing. Well, it doesn't mean one thing anymore. You have to look at the framework. How does that business operate? So uh, that's up to you guys. A lot of times you're digging in and you're trying to figure out well, how are you operating? And there are some very creative entrepreneurs out there right now. And uh, I was one of them back in 2013. Thank goodness uh, I have the credentials to sit on the North Carolina Board, uh, Board of Health and help them decide what is a commercial kitchen, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, I have a long history of teaching in the um, food service industry. I'm a senior instructor for Johnson Wells University for 22 years, uh, although now retired. Um, the city kitch, which is what I own, um, has private suites and we have separate businesses and I have 50 different businesses that work inside one 12,000 square foot location. And boy, that was tough to get through the first time. Uh, I have been able to write for the state of North Carolina some guidelines for inspection. I was able to work with the inspectors and the state level uh, of, of what's a good way to say, hey, yes, you can do this, but with these parameters. Um, so that does exist in North Carolina. Um, going into a virtual kitchen, again, another really cool term, what's a virtual kitchen? Um, that kind of sounds like you're going to put big glasses on and you're going to be like uh, chopping vegetables somewhere that you're not really chopping vegetables. Uh, that is a real misnomer term. That particular term really doesn't mean anything in the industry. It's just a cool techie term. It just means you're not where you think you are. Um, and your food is coming from maybe somewhere you don't think it is. And I know that sounds terribly unsafe, um, but sometimes it is coming from a, a um, permitted kitchen hopefully most of the time it's coming from a permitted kitchen, especially brands. If you're dealing with any kind of a, a, a well-known brand, they're not going to deal with some of these unscrupulous small pop-up kitchens that have been coming up, uh, which leads me to a couple more terms, this anonymous kitchen and dark kitchens. You'll hear that term sometimes too. Um, dark can come because um, they're, they're literally in hideaway places like parking lots, uh, cargo containers, um, really interesting and really creative places that some of these entrepreneurs can get started. And um, I hate to say it, but a lot of them are just not aware that they have regulations that they need to go through or somebody somewhere told them no, or they decided it was going to be easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, or they don't understand um, the benefit that we have of serving the public and how different that is, how the standard is so different from feeding your family. Um, and then you have all kinds of different um, rules and restrictions that are for the for the you know the good of the public. Um, so you'll you'll hear some negative terms like dark kitchen, uh, but sometimes that also means I know this is uh, one on one here, but uh, sometimes dark kitchen also means that the restaurant doesn't look like it's open, but their kitchen is open. Um, and a lot of our folks have had to do that during COVID. They have the chairs up in the front. There's no staff. Uh, there's no entry into the front. They are drive-through only, or 
they have curbside service. Um, you've seen many national chains pretty quickly adapt to a curbside service um, situation. And it seems like that would be a dark kitchen. So you will hear those two terms. It's not um, innately negative or positive. Again, drill down, ask questions. That's gonna be your friend is to say, well, how does this operation operate? What is the framework? And that will tell you what you're dealing with and how you're gonna be able to um, inspect them, permit them, or uh, tell them to pack it up, you know, depending on what's going on. Um, the anonymous kitchen, <laughs> Uh, another term that's been popping up, and uh, and this simply means uh, sometimes you'll end up with what's called a ghost kitchen. Okay, it's a kitchen that's producing food, but it will be um, representing, say, six different menus, six different, um, completely different things. You can have Korean and Thai and pizza and, and burgers um, from the same three chefs that are producing, <laughs> and, um, they're working off of all these different menus, uh, that are out there and that they're branded differently. They're branded separately. Uh, the customer, the consumer does not know, hence the term anonymous. Uh, the consumer does not know, um, really that they're ordering from the same basic operation that's just set up for several different menus. And I know that can cause you guys some real issues when you're trying to look at their menu and look at their processes and um, what are their times and their temps and their holding and do they have the proper equipment for what they say they're producing on their menu. You can't just willy nilly change your menu because um, you guys have to make sure that they have all the right uh, equipment and um, sanitation services and various things available um, to make sure they're doing it right. Uh, I understand there's a big boom and I understand that, you know, more than 50% and, and I'm sure you guys know this statistic um, are folks that are ordering uh, delivery and delivery is the big driver right now because of COVID. Uh, a lot of folks are limiting their contact. Of course, you know about that. And, um, you know, they're going online to these third party uh, delivery systems and there's a lot of them out there. Um, more than just the big three that you hear of all the time. And uh, some companies have their own um, apps and pads and uh, systems, internal systems where you can order directly from them. Uh, of course, the more sophisticated spend the more money on the tech and are able to do that. Um, you know, since it does cut some of their costs down, uh, they're able to spend more money on better packaging, perhaps relieving some of the problems of time and temperature. Uh, definitely one of the things that, that all of these kitchens share is that they are getting closer to their consumer, uh, which is good because they're limiting the amount of time that you have food sitting in um, 70 degree hot back seat of a car um, while folks are delivering. Um, I know that doesn't seem, well, I do that with my family all the time. What's the difference? Well, you're not serving the public and you're not held to certain rules and guidelines. Uh, as those of us who produce professionally are. Um, we're held to educational standards. We're held to HACCP principles. We are held to all these things. And uh, it's not just because you fed your family, you know, for 15 years that you can start serving the public. We all know that's not how it works. But that is the general consensus. That is what people think. This is what you're dealing with. And I, I know you deal with it on a daily basis. I know you do. Uh, so your job is education. Your job is to say, uh, this is how you can do it. Uh, instead of always saying no, and I get it, say no when you need to say no for sure. Um, but I know a lot of the hoops that I had to jump through were just did not make sense to me. And um, I, I did some educating, you know, on the state level and uh, had some great experiences and relationships and was able to um, work with the folks that are regulating my business and be able to say, well, see, this is how we have been able to work out this solution and this is what we're dealing with you know a lot of it obviously is time and space separation you know that's a big deal uh if you guys utilize that even more uh it really helps with the space and time separation you've got day parts you've got 24 hours in a day um you know the problem is there's just not enough of you guys you know especially with cutbacks and and i feel for you i can't imagine how big your territories are and you're trying to keep up with what's going on and you hear a rumor that somebody popped up somewhere uh, i know you're dealing with that so you're going to hear all these weirdo terms 
Um, what I wanted to leave you with um, is this, la this last one here called Cloud Kitchen. And that's kind of a new cool term as well. And that one was specifically coined because the start of this particular business. And this was a gentleman who was on the board and one of the first investors in um, Uber. So plenty of money behind this one. And they're really trying to keep that coin, that term coined so that when you think of these ghost kitchens that you immediately think, oh, you mean a cloud kitchen? So cloud is the, is the, uh, the word that they're trying to really get out there. The generic term is ghost kitchen, but they can operate in a lot of different ways. Um, if we can um, get together uh, as individual states or even the federal government, you know, depending on what version you are on, on your code, um, of some of what some of these definitions are or how to operate um, using some of these newfound entrepreneurial ways of, you know, framing businesses and, and business models and uh, whatnot. And we, we educate our folks. I think that, that, that inspecting is going to work easier for you. Um, I hope because we're not the enemy, we're there to help them. We tell them that every day. Uh, I understand I have a lot of companies that work with me and I'm you know, kind of the mean mom that has to go in and talk and say, hey, we gotta change this, we gotta do this. Uh, another big issue for you guys is PIC, uh, figuring out who the PIC is uh, of any given place at any given time. Uh, and I know that's a big guy, big one for you guys, I think as, as that gets figured out. Um, that's going to be a biggie on figuring out what these kitchens are. And it doesn't matter what you call them, whether you call them a ghost kitchen or a dark kitchen or anonymous kitchen or a cloud kitchen. They're all commercial kitchens with different frameworks. If you can go on to the next slide. So safety and sanitation, guys, it's what we do. Education is what we do trying to maintain the standards and hold people's feet to the fire. I completely understand the tough job that you have. Uh, I'm here to help you guys. I'm a resource, I'm retired. Um, I'm in the business, obviously, and uh, I'm in the business of education as well as being in the business of owning commercial kitchens. Um, and uh, I, I work closely with the uh, federal and state departments to make sure that we're doing things right and that we're also educating each other because food technology is changing. Uh, it's not just, um, you know, even temperatures are changing. I know there's some crazy stuff, molecular, molecular gastronomy and whatnot um, on the horizon. So we're constantly learning. Um, I just, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'd like to ask or see if there's any questions. We have a moderator. So if you want to type in or raise your hand and, and see if I can answer any questions for you, I'm gonna be here for a little bit. Thank you guys for joining me today. Great information. Thank you, Chef Kerry. Um, we do have some questions in the chat, but we're going to go ahead and wait until um, Ilana is done, and then we'll go ahead and answer them at that time. Perfect. Right. Yep. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, will be Ilana. She's going to uh, talk about Ghost Kitchen and give you a regulatory perspective. Whenever you're ready, Ilana. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Um, all right, so uh, I work for the Nassau County Department of Health uh, that's uh, here on Long Island in New York. Uh, I assume this is working. Okay, uh, so for us, the ghost kitchen, you know, is definitely a newer concept in like the last couple of years, but even prior to that, we were working with similar concepts. Uh, even though we didn't actually regulate any uh, full shared use commercial kitchens, like incubator type kitchens, we have found over time that we did have it on a small scale going on. So based off of that, we developed a bit of a program here so we would know how to deal with them going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, I don't know the content's not on the screen. There we go. All right. So um, when somebody approaches us or we find another uh, person operating uh, somewhere, we have a bunch of issues that we want to identify. First of all, who, who's running this, this extra business? Is it actually the existing permitted operator that's there already just running, say, a secondary menu, basically running like a ghost kitchen in there? Is it a third party? Is it their brother who thinks they're operating under their own permit? So we get all these different um, 
you know, things going on. We do want to find out what, what, what are they doing? Are they catering? Are they preparing a packaged food item? Because perhaps it doesn't fall under health department jurisdiction. It may fall under somebody else's. Um, does the physical facility actually have the capacity to operate a second business of any kind in its currently approved state? So our food facilities are required to go through a plan review process. And in that plan review, they are submitting that they are going to be operating a specific type of operation. If they start falling outside of that, well, it could cause uh, some kind of a problem and may need to be reviewed. They may need to make modifications. And that leads to the next part. Is plan review necessary for this other business or the expansion of this business that's taking place? And the last item on here was something that we thought was uh, important, especially with more of this concept of the ghost kitchen is somewhere along the way, they need to clearly state where the food is being made. So we have actually found that some of the ones that have come to our attention, they will advertise and they'll be like, it's business such and such at another restaurant and they, and they list the restaurant's name or they will list the address. We've also come across not just that it's an entire, um, let's say business operating in another location, but like a, a specific food concept. I can't recall what the business name was. It's some kind of branded, it was some kind of a burger. And we actually found like through, I think it was DoorDash that if you choose and you type in that you wanna find this burger, like a couple of dozen of our permitted facilities make this item. And that is something that they're doing in addition to what we normally have them permitted as that they're a sandwich shop, they're whatever it is. Uh, but what we did notice on a website such as DoorDash is that if you scroll to the bottom, it actually told you what the address was, where the food was being prepared. And to us, that was an important feature so that you know the source of, of your food items. Next slide, please. So in order to get this going, we do require that they send us a written proposal. This way we have something physical to actually review instead of just the endless conversation that we have with them on the phone. And we, will, we have something now to hold them to. So when we do give them uh, hopefully an eventual approval, we're saying this is what is approved. So there's a whole bunch of things that we do ask them to address. Um, the next items on the slide. Okay, so clearly we need to know who, who are you. <laughs> um, we want their contact information, their names, their phone numbers, but uh, you know, of course, where are they planning to operate out of? Because we're gonna do a little bit of research to make sure that this is A, a facility that's already under permit to us. Um, if it is not, then they will need to start from scratch and go through our plan review process. Uh, next section. We also ask them to outline the nature of the business, and this includes a lot of different aspects. So, you know, of course, we want a sample menu. What kind of foods are you going to be serving? Because uh, again, we may find that what they're doing is bottling hot sauce, which would not fall under our jurisdiction, and we would make the appropriate referrals. Uh, we want to know how they're getting their ingredients. Are they going shopping themselves? Are they going to uh, Costco? Are they going to Restaurant Depot? Are they getting an actual delivery of their ingredients? Is it part and parcel of the, op uh, the restaurant that they're already operating at? Next slide. We also need to know when are they going to operate in this location, and that's mostly relative to the existing permit holders' operational hours. We can't have them tripping over each other. So we have had businesses that have come into um, uh, some of our existing facilities that sometimes aren't even um, under our jurisdiction. They might be under state agriculture, and they're like a meal prep type business, and they come in at two o'clock in the morning. Well, our business is a pizzeria. They are not there at two o'clock in the morning. So clearly this would not be a space and time issue for them. We also need them to address what kind of storage space is available to them. Do they have refrigeration, freezer space, dry storage space? Will it be designated just for their use? Will they perhaps have a locked cage in the walk-in box or um, their own refrigerator that they can lock up? Because especially if they're a third party operating somewhere, we do like to point out to them that in addition to food safety, we do a food security to make sure that they're in control of their ingredients, that nobody can tamper with them or you know, cause other harm. We wanna know how their food is getting to their customers. So you know, with your typical ghost kitchen, everything's delivery. 
there's no coming to pick up. But some of them, again, it's an alternate menu that's being operated by the same exact restaurant under the same corporate structure. There's no real change to it. So they may come and pick it up, whatever it is. We, we want them to tell us as much information about their business as possible. And then we also ask for their operational capacity. So how many clients might they be servicing? Uh, if they're doing uh, catering, uh, are you doing catering for parties only up to 50 or is it up to 300? Um, how many meals might you be preparing between deliveries or times that you're actually operating? And again, that talks to the capacity of the physical space that is there for them to, you know, be able to safely prepare the food. All right, uh, next slide. All right, so, you know, we review the proposal. If we find it to be satisfactory and it doesn't require any further review, we'll put it under permit. And that's just our regular permit process at that point. Uh, if it's something that's already operating by the existing uh, permitted folks under the same corporation, we will put a note in their file. We may make a, a physical amendment to their permit to reflect uh, the multiple DBAs that they're operating under. Uh, but we also have uh, the ability on their physical permit, uh, there's a whole blank section that we've got that we can add in this information. So again, for us, some of it's all about documenting. We have in the past gotten complaints about some mystery business that we can't identify. And when we contact the existing operator at that address, they go, oh yeah, that, that's us. We just um, run a late night menu or something like that, or, or this is um, you know, something alternative, or we find out it's actually a, uh, another person altogether. Uh, with, with COVID, um, oddly enough, we get a, a food handlers reported to us that are COVID positive. And sometimes we're getting ones that are reported to us for places that don't exist. And it turns out they are um, ghost kitchens. Uh, so that's happened, I believe, more than once. Um, and we've also found where there's a secondary business actually operating in there. And it's a completely different, like it might've been a family member and they're like, yeah, we just thought it'd be nice to give them counter space. And here they are, but they're operating a business with their own tax ID and their own um, corporate structure. Well, those folks need to do their own permit. And that's the last item that's on the page here is that if there's a third party operator, they clearly need to apply for their own permit. And some of these existing operators don't, really think that much about it. But if something goes wrong with that business, the liability falls on them. Why? Because by all appearances, it looks like they're operating under that restaurant's existing permit. When you point that out to them, they kind of get upset and they make sure that everybody's filing their paperwork pretty promptly after that. We've developed a few years ago, a shared kitchen agreement which basically just states that uh, responsibility is shared of the kitchen. They will adhere to the relevant codes. We do have the existing permitted operator um, who's leasing out the space, let's say. Uh, they have to sign it as well as the second party. So this way, everybody is basically covered. Um, and then, you know, they're... they're we have the documentation for all of them. So we have had a couple of locations where we actually do have a few permits. So it's, some of them are less about ghost kitchens because some of them do operate as, as a little bit of a storefront. Our shared kitchen thing kind of grew a little bit because we had a lot of like foundling, um, you know, people who we don't have a proper incubator kitchen, like a large facility in this county. Um, the, the one or two that we had mostly seemed to host uh, state agriculture type wholesale businesses. So they, were, they, didn't, they weren't doing prepared foods, but we have these startup businesses. And for a lot of them, this is a win-win situation. You've got a restaurant who doesn't operate round the clock, um, they lease out space, a full commercial kitchen to somebody else who now doesn't have to make a capital investment. They're getting some extra money from this little bit of rent or whatever it is. So it's kind of a little bit of a win-win for them because one guy's making extra money, the other one's getting a kitchen on the cheap. And for some, we've, we've actually seen some places that have used this as their leg up and then they eventually open up their own business. And what I have noticed is that some of these are like our, what I like to call our Facebook bakers. You know, they're all those folks who like advertise on their Facebook and Instagram pages about all these beautiful cupcakes and, and stuff that they're making it, you know, of course they're making it in their home. Uh, this gives them a, a way to become uh, legitimate uh, in terms of having a proper permit and proper licensing. 
So in as far as the ghost kitchens go, we're kind of using the same template that we use for our previous shared kitchen uh, operations so that they will go forward with that. Uh, I was recently approached by uh, an individual who said that he wanted to open up like this large kitchen, looked in a way similar to what uh, Chef Carey was describing, and he would possibly have up to like six or seven different businesses running in there. He was unclear though, if he was gonna run them all himself and just hire professionals in the different uh, cuisines that he was looking to feature, or if he was gonna lease out the space. So people have always gotten creative, especially when the economy goes south and when people are in dire straits, you know, and the pandemic certainly has shown that. We get a lot of phone calls about people trying to figure out what can I do to basically make money and do what they love to do. So, you know, this whole development of this concept has actually helped, I think, a lot of these businesses. And I think it's great if we can work with them. I mean, some are clearly like just wrong. They're just bad. They're bad concepts. They don't know what they're doing. Um, but if we can help educate them and get them to um, do the right thing in terms of operating safely, getting their permits in order, then, you know, we're, we're doing what we should be doing. And um, I think that's basically it. I think the last slide just has my contact information. And um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions or comments. Thank you, Ilana. We do have um, quite a bit of questions in the chat. Um, the first question is for um, Chef Kerry. Um, is shared use commercial kitchen same as commissary kitchen? Uh, no, but the terms are sometimes used interchangeably. Commissary specifically means you are producing a large amount of food under one brand that goes out to satellite locations. Uh, that is what a commissary is. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, um, I can go to both of you. Um, is there likely to be multiple PIC in shared kitchen? And I'll start with uh, Ilana. So I would assume that like if we've got multiple businesses operating in there, then clearly there should be somebody in charge of each kitchen. Um, our current code that we adhere to doesn't actually call out for a PIC specifically, but we do look for somebody who is knowledgeable. We do tend to find that our secondary operators, as I usually refer to them in these kitchens, they're usually very small operations. So it's usually owner operated for the most part. Uh, you know, and they might have like, a, you know, some assistance, but it's not the ones that we found so far. They're not large staff. The other um, ghost kitchens that we find are actually almost just like alternate menus operated by an existing restaurant that's just advertising something else. Chef Carey, do you like to comment on that? Um, yes. Would you restate the original question, if you don't mind? Um, yes. Um, is there likely to be multiple PIC in shared kitchens? Uh, I can only speak for North Carolina. And um, one of the things we do is just make sure that uh, anyone who is going to be a PIC is serve safe certified. Uh, it's at least a good start or one of the other national certification programs. And um, in North Carolina, we are required to have a PIC um, available whenever that operation is running. So I have, let's say I have 12 different um, companies that are all there at the same time. You know, I have 60, but it's like a gym membership. They're not all at there at the same time. But let's say I had 12 that are all there at the same time. Each one of them must have their own PIC who is Serve Safe certified and uh, management staff that is able to open and close that operation and they must be present during their business hours. Um, PIC was extended differently to my operation because we are there during business hours, even though the facility is 24 seven and our PIC is inspected or uh, must be available for facility issues as we do not produce food. Thank you. Um... 
we do have another question. This is for um, Chef Kerry. Um, another commissary uh, question. So what is the difference between a commissary kitchen that rents out to caterers versus a cloud kitchen? Well, Cloud Kitchen is a trademarked name and Cloud Kitchen belongs to a particular company that owns what's called Cloud Kitchens. Uh, if you use that term generically, then you're really talking about a ghost kitchen. Um, and there are, uh, as uh, Ilana was talking about, is that there are many existing and permitted companies, uh, restaurants and food producers that will allow someone to come in and work on the side and that is where she was saying most of the work comes in is trying to figure out what is their operation and um, can that be worked within the existing operation and that's certainly case by case basis and probably um, Ilana could talk better about that one. Ilana? Um, I'm, I'm sorry so in terms of the the I guess the question was more about the, the commissary kitchens and the caterers. Commissary kitchen and cloud kitchen. Right. I mean, for us, again, some, sometimes it just comes down to the definition. But again, the commissary kitchen, um, we kind of use a similar definition in that uh, the few commissaries that we have are producing food either prepackaged for, let's say, food trucks, things like that, or um, it's a commissary that is producing uh, prepared meals. Uh, that are going out, let's say, to schools or perhaps um, a larger uh, corporate kitchen might have this main facility where they now send out food to five of their local locations. Mm -hmm. So it's, I wouldn't necessarily consider them the, the same thing. Right. Uh, just the commissary is, you know, really its own and saying the cloud kitchen is when you talk about cloud kitchens, virtual kitchens, ghost kitchens, to us, what that really means is really what Chef Carey had said earlier, is just that there's um, there's no real uh, public presence other than advertising and a menu. Uh, you know, you you phone in, you order your food online, you maybe call it in, uh, you use an app, the website, whatever it is, and your food typically is delivered, um, or possibly there might be a pickup location. If I could offer. Uh, a bit more clarity, Iana, thank you. you. You brought a point to my mind, so I appreciate that. Is that uh, the term again, cloud kitchen, since it's come up a couple times here, is uh, again, that is a particular brand name of commercial kitchen that allows other companies to work inside of it. Uh, and some of those companies that work inside of what's called a cloud kitchen, which again, that's a brand name, uh, just like the City Kitch is my brand name. I am not a ghost kitchen. I am a commercial shared use kitchen. Uh, but ghost kitchens can work inside, same as I could have caterers that work inside. I can have bakers that work inside. I can have food trucks that work inside. Lots of different uh, types of companies, organizations, frameworks work within um, the shared use commercial kitchen that is uh, a larger usually facility, but, but any different type of food business can work inside of that. So I am not a ghost kitchen. Cloud Kitchens is not a ghost kitchen, but they have many ghost kitchens that work inside of them. Hope that helps. Yes, thank you for that. Um, the next question is related to delivery companies. Um, is there any type of um, vetting process for these uh, delivery companies, uh, Chef Kerry? Uh, vetting, not so much. Um, the, uh, what it really comes down to is money. Uh, you know, I would love to say it's something different than that, but uh, some of these individual companies may have their brother running food uh, for them. You know, their uncle, their cousin, their whatever. It's just a car with a human in it. Um, they're not held to any kind of standard uh, as far as keeping that food safe or the packaging that that food has to be in. All of that relates back to the food preparer uh, and the company that prepared that food. So, you know, a driver can come from anywhere. Um, Ilana, so during those inspections, do you ask questions in, related to these deliveries, um, the companies? Um, 
we don't, so just a real quick thing, we don't regulate in our county any of the, the food delivery services, the Uber Eats, the, uh, the, you know, the DoorDash, Grubhub, whatever. We don't regulate any of those. Um, the general rule of thumb usually is that, um, you know, it is difficult to regulate those third party ones or to even provide them with information because we have no contact with them. They're all just fly by night kind of thing. But it wouldn't be really any different than any of the guidance that we would normally provide to one of our regular operators in that uh, if you're delivering food to locations that they should either be within a certain radius, that your route shouldn't be so long, and that if it is beyond anything that one would consider unsafe, that you should have the proper means of either hot or cold holding the food. So, you know, I, I think that your average, um, you know, Uber Eats type of driver, they just literally, you know, you see it, you go into the restaurant, they grab the bags, they go, they're taking it, they're coming and going. But as was pointed out, one thing that uh, popped up with this is that the food delivery has become a lot closer because it's usually done in the neighborhood. So uh, almost all of our businesses at this point deliver. It's always come up more of an issue with people that are catering. So, um, you know, we do ask in, in the proposal. So like, as an example, one of our, our things that have popped up recently, uh, I, I don't know, I guess you can never have too many people making charcuterie platters. And um, we've gotten a number of proposals and they're, they're operating in like existing places. One's in like a deli, one's running out of a restaurant. One of the questions we do ask them is, okay, so you bought your food, you prepared your platter, where are you storing it? How is your food getting to the customer? And they said, well, it stays in the refrigerator and the customer picks it up. They, some of them don't even want to deal with delivery. And then others do say, yes, we do deliver. And we will ask, what is your delivery radius or, or time frame in terms of delivery? So we do bring that up as a question in terms of the safety aspect, make sure that the foods are hopefully staying in the proper temperature when delivered to the customer. Great, that's great, thank you. Um, so this question, next question is for you, Ilana. Um, do you have any kind of checklist for reviewing these types, types of applications or plans? So the thing with the proposal that we asked for, um, there's nothing formal. So we don't have like an actual like application for it or anything like that. Internally, uh, we kind of have like an email template that we will use. It was just something that I kind of developed with, a, you know, realize we keep asking these same questions. I distributed it to the folks in my office so that if anybody inquires that this way, please share this information with the operators. It makes my life easier because I'm the one who usually ends up reviewing almost all of them. And this way, you know, it's like anything else. It's even like regular, like, you know, restaurant plan review with, with, when we're looking at the full place. The more information you give us, the faster I can get back to you and get you under permit and, and get your business moving. So it has been helpful to have this, this template. And, and most of it's really what were in the earlier slides, actually. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question here is, um, does the commercial, commercial share kitchen or a ghost kitchen generally provide labeling oversight for food, product, uh, for food produced at that location? and what services outside just the building and equipment are generally provided. And I'll go to uh, Chef Carrie for that. <laughs> okay, great. A um, couple of things. One is they are their own business. Um, they have their own permits and they have their own requirements. So we're not in their space telling them what to do. Um, what we do is provide them with everything they need to be safe. We provide all the chemicals, we provide the instructions for the chemicals, we provide um, access to third party delivery uh, services. We provide um, training as far as not just our facility, but uh, in general food safety training, just like if you would if they were an employee, but they're not an employee, they are their own business. And then, of course, we have the serve safe training, uh, which we have uh, brought under our wing as well now. So we do teach quite a bit uh, and uh, create serve safe managers as, we're, as well as just basic food service handling for folks that are new to a kitchen. Um, but uh, I think that depends. I think they, well, let me back up. They tried to get me to do that uh, back in 2013. They wanted me to be responsible for 50 different companies 
foods, uh, uh, food safety, and uh, that was a no-go. And um, I had to make sure that the responsibility was squarely on their shoulders. So um, in just in the question, the way the question was just worded, there was um, difficulty uh, just with the question. A commercial shared use kitchen is not a ghost kitchen. A commercial shared use kitchen is where many different types of food businesses operate. Some of them are ghost kitchens. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is for Ilana. Um, so do you have a different way on how you would handle the foodborne illness um, when it comes to the ghost kitchens? Well, um, not really. I mean, I would imagine that we would follow the same procedures. Um, I don't think we've actually had an allegation um, yet, um, but I can't, the problem that we would likely encounter is that, you know, part of the foodborne illness investigation, other than doing the epidemiology work, is clearly going to the site for an inspection and an evaluation, food prep reviews, et cetera. Um, you know, if some of the ghost kitchens only operate very, very limited hours, and they may also operate in hours that are not within our regular workday. So I could definitely see that it could present a logistical issue with doing the on-site inspection. Now, of course, they're operating in some type of permitted kitchen that we would have access to anyway. So we still could conduct a general inspection, but we wouldn't necessarily be conducting something of their operation if it's not one of the days that they actually work. Thank you. Um, the next question, let me see here. Does the commercial shared kitchen or a ghost kitchen generally provide labeling oversight for food produced at that location? Well, I think we just answered that question. <laughs> All right, um, let me see. They, they took another, another little turn on it, just asking about food labeling. Right. Uh, and I can speak to that. Oh, okay, uh, great, thank you. We have our own uh, inside system that we use, that we created. Uh, of inspecting each one of our clients. We do that to, for them as a service. Um, we inspect before say, you know, Ilana's people would inspect. You know, we're obviously in two different locations, but um, we do that to ease up uh, everything that, that has, that sits on the shoulders of the inspectors. And it gives them an opportunity for us to be able to say, this needs to be labeled this way, this needs to be changed, this needs to move to a lower shelf. You know, whatever the issues are, it gives us a, a format to be able to, to speak with them and say, you got to change this and this and this. And that's really the education piece. Um, am I responsible for their labeling? I am not. Um, but if they make mistakes, we go in and correct them and educate them. And we also penalize them if they don't learn. Okay, great. There's so many questions trying to keep up with all of them. Um, <laughs> the next question is, can you provide guidance on how we can require ghost kitchens to apply for a permit or submit document when it is not specifically indicated or defined in our regulations? Mm -hmm. And this is for Ilana. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's nothing real specific in our regulations. We just kind of evolve things as a general rule here, uh, you know, because as I'm sure we've all discovered just when we thought that we finally got a handle on some new concept. So let's say we get a handle on this, they will come up with another concept. And, you know, we just we're always playing catch up with all of that. So we we're really just using our existing framework. Uh, the only thing that we had added to our arsenal was really this um, shared kitchen agreement, which is very generic. Um, and it really is just, we want to know kind of that this person who's proposing this whole second business or third or fourth business in a facility actually has permission <laughs> to do it. Like that they're not, that it's not just some, one of the prep guys on the side, like letting you know, his buddy in in the middle of the night to sit there and make pizza or, or some weird thing. Uh, so we do want to know that there is some legitimate aspect to it. But the permitting that these second operators may go through, it's they're submitting this exact same paperwork that anybody else would. The difference is, is that we do require them to submit a proposal to be approved 
prior to us actually giving them the permit application paperwork. We don't just want permit applications showing up in our office and we don't know what they go with. It, it might be something that we might not approve. We do come across these things every once in a while where somebody says, oh, well, uh, you know, we ask, what's the nature of your business? Where are you preparing the food? Well, I marinate everything at home and then I bring it to the kitchen that I, I want to put under permit. And no, no, you're not making anything at home. So, you know, we we try to nip those in the bud. We make them understand. Hopefully they're complying. Uh, but we, we really are just using the framework that we've already got. And, you know, just developing that little template for a proposal was just something that we came up with just to help us. Thank you. Uh, and there's a similar uh, related questions. Um, again, this is uh, for you. How are you finding out about these operations? Are you actively searching for them or is it mainly through company, uh, through complaints? It's, I'm going to say, I'll be honest, we don't go looking for them. Um, we have enough work to do. We have enough places <laughs> under permit. Um, so we don't actively look for them. They tend to fall on our lap, um, but some of them do come through complaints because what does happen is inevitably the people who went through the right channels, the ones who spent all the money, the one who jumped through all of our hoops and got themselves a legitimately permitted businesses, they like to narc on everybody else. So they're, you know, they, they're all seeing it, especially it popped up even more so than ever before during the pandemic, um, you know, people preparing food in their own homes. So we try to put a stop to those. We're kind of limited as to what we can do about somebody doing that. But some of those people do like to go legit. They're like, oh, there's a proper way to do this. You know what, I'm really good at what I'm doing. I wanna make a real business. So, you know, we give them some, some suggestions and some of them end up going through this route of, you know, working inside of an existing kitchen. Uh, so via the complaint format, some of them do come to our attention like that. Um, others just, spontaneously contact us and say, this is what I want to do. And they propose something that we would never approve. We've mentioned this as an alternative to them. Hey, listen, if you can find an existing restaurant that's already under permit to us or a deli or a bakery that's willing to rent you space or, or let you come in and, and use this time. And, and they're intrigued by the idea usually because they realize that it means they don't have to build a whole kitchen and go through you know, all sorts of different planning processes. It's definitely a simpler thing for them. So we do pick them up that way. Sometimes we just see them advertised in the paper um, and they come to our attention and we're like, all right, fine. We, there was one recently that we found out about that way. Um, you know, we followed up with them and I believe it's operating. I don't remember what the outcome was, honestly, but I think it's operating as like a quick service lunch from a regular uh, restaurant dining. Um, they just decide to offer like an alternate lunch menu essentially. And uh, it's the same people running it. I think it's just like their family members doing it, but it's all under the auspices of the existing corporation. They didn't form a new business for it. It's just part and parcel. And that was as a result of something in the newspaper. Like I said, we found one out recently because we had a COVID positive food worker reported to us. And when we followed up, we're like, this business doesn't exist. And then we found out, of course it exists. Um, and it was one of these uh, people that decided to run like a, a bakery inside of another bakery or something to that effect. So that's how we find out about some of them as well. Thank you. And our next question um, goes to Chef Carey. Um, with Ghost Kitchen, do they share a common storage um, like walk-in cooler, freezer, and so forth? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we have different levels of something like membership and uh, they can even, they can have, at the highest levels, they can have their very own room, their very own prep station, their very own hood, their own refrigerator, their own dry storage, all within their own lockable space. So that's our highest level. And uh, that's of course, completely private. Um, and then we have uh, all the very lowest uh, and you know, a couple in between, but the very lowest is, is called shared. And um, that is where they have dry storage. They have their own um, set of shelving, uh, like Metro shelving, something like that, that is their own, but it can be contiguous with somebody else's. 
um, dry storage, you know, that's next to it in the same area and is not locked. And um, they can certainly lock it if they want to. They can bring in a locked cage if they want to. Um, but we just don't provide that. So that's shared. The refrigerator is also shared, but we have our folks on rolling racks and they have to have a zippered cover and, um, and they have their own spaces uh, in, in that refrigerator. Uh, our health department requires that they have uh, dry storage space available to them and refrigerated storage um, available to them. Uh, and that's our limiting factor is how much refrigeration do we have is how many clients we can have at any given time. Very good, thank you. And uh, I think this is our last question here. Um, this is for Ilana. Have you ever shut um, one of the ghost kitchens? Um, not that I can recall. I mean, we haven't come across that many. Um, we did threaten to close a bunch down because they were operating out of, uh, this woman used to have a catering, uh, just a kitchen. Um, there was no seating. It, was, it wasn't like a catering hall. It was just a kitchen. And um, I think she sort of slowed down her own catering business over time. She started to lease out space. Like she essentially made herself a shared use uh, mm -hmm. kitchen, just not not one of these beautiful facilities that Chef Carrie has, it's just a regular kitchen and some book guy was doing this, someone was doing that and she didn't maintain her permit. So, um, you know, she let it lapse and she's like, well, I'm not catering anymore. Um, so I don't need a permit. Yeah, but you're renting it out to all these other people who are relying on your base permit in order for their operation. You need to renew it. She kept waffling back and forth. We're like, well, then nobody's going to be allowed to operate. Oh, okay. We got her permit renewal. That was probably about the closest that maybe we got to it, but we haven't actually shut any down. Um, we haven't seen anything too egregious. I saw something in the chat about the, the uh, storage container kitchens. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen any of those popping up in parking lots. We have a few storage containers out there, but they're permitted facilities. They tend to be like bars or like little snack areas. Uh, not, not too many of them. Um, haven't seen anything else. I, I, I think most of the regulators would agree that we all hate the word pop-up. Um, nothing should just pop up because that just never goes well. Um, so anytime we get anything like that, we do try to rein it in and either put the kibosh on it if, if necessary or you know get them under permit. But definitely there's a lot more going on out there that either just hasn't migrated its way to um, our county or is just, you know, we're not aware of it. All right, thank you so much. Um, Steve, did I miss any questions here? I know I'm trying to keep up with all the questions that are coming up in chat, but I think um, I got most of them. Um, You're good. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so thank you, Chef Carrie and, and Ilana. Um, that was great presentations and responses to those questions. So thank you so much.